Alex Capstick presents a special program on the impact of transgender athletes competing in women's sport in Transgender Identity and Sport. It's a dispute which is dividing sport. Is the integrity of female competition at risk or is the inclusion of trans athletes a basic human right which everyone should accept? If there's a rule out there that uh, the governing bodies lay down and you adhere to the rules, um, you know, it kind of tells that they've done their due diligence. The rules allowing trans females to compete against other women are based on testosterone, but some believe that doesn't go far enough. At the end of the day, it, it's a male body uh, against a female body, and the science is there and the science tells us that that performance gap is huge. So, is it possible trans women could take over female sport? Transgender women have been competing in sports for decades. And they're not dominating the podium at the Olympics. Finding a solution is proving a real headache for sports decision makers. We want people to be able to compete, but we also want it to be fair. Uh, and so I think we need to sort it out as soon as we can. In the foothills of the Colorado Rockies, an elite athlete enjoys the freedom of the open road. But Gillian Bearden's cycling career has been far from an easy ride. She's transgender. After a long struggle with her identity, she now competes as a woman. You know, it started at an early age, really ever since I could really remember a thought. I think the feelings of me not feeling normal in my own body was present. I tried to come out throughout the years. I kind of suppressed all of it by taking antidepressants. Um, so I did that for a number of years to try to cope with uh, the feeling inside me. Gillian found refuge in cycling, but after transitioning, she thought she would have to give it up. Then the International Olympic Committee relaxed its rules on transgender athletes. The requirements for reassignment surgery was dropped. Gillian was free to compete against women as long as she took hormone therapy to reduce her testosterone levels. To be honest with you, I didn't think I'd ever cycle again. Um, not in a race. One of my, the best days of my life is hearing that the rules had changed for the International Olympic Committee. And uh, um, once I heard that, I, I, I felt there could be a glimpse of hope of me competing again. More than 2,000 kilometers northwest of Colorado is the city of Portland in Oregon. We went there to meet medical expert, trans athlete and IOC advisor, Joanna Harper. We're walking into the Gamma Knife Suite here. In this her day job is treating cancer patients. In her spare time, she conducts her own independent research, which has played a significant role in determining the rules on trans athletes. Much of your research is based on the advantages testosterone gives trans women athletes. Why testosterone? Testosterone is the primary difference between male athletes and female athletes. It certainly isn't the only difference, but it, it is the number one most important factor that differentiates male athletes from female athletes. Uh, and so and the IAAF and the IOC have certainly known that, but I did, the data that I had showed just how much difference it can make in transgender athletic performance and that if they enacted testosterone-based rules, transgender women would not be taking over women's sports. Gillian was happy to comply with the regulations and in 2016 she made her debut in the female category. It was an amazing day and I remember at the start line, you know, with, you know, 30 other women around me and, you know, I had kind of tears coming out of my eyes. The race in general was just as tough as anything else. Testosterone blockers, they do exactly that, right, you know? Lots of people think that trans women should not be allowed to compete against biological females, that you have an unfair advantage. Why do you think you should be allowed to take part in these competitions? If there's a rule out there that uh, the governing bodies lay down and you adhere to the rules, um, you know, it kind of tells that they've done their due diligence. And you're confident those rules create a level playing field? 
I do. Yeah, absolutely. Pretty much what we're doing is we're just mimicking uh, what a biological female has had her whole life um, and matching that. But Gillian still faces resistance in the pursuit of her sporting ambitions from people who think trans athletes, especially trans women, should be barred from competition. The debate intensified following recent comments from prominent sports stars, among them Britain's former Olympic swimmer Sharon Davis, who was critical of the current guidelines. What I'm saying is that, you know, biologically, if you go through puberty as a young male, you come out with the other side with, with all the benefits of a, a larger heart, you're probably taller and stronger, you certainly have more testosterone, which will have given your muscle memory, um, you have more blood, red, red blood cells, you have a, a denser bone structure. All of these things won't go. They will stay with you. The, the things that are part of your DNA will stay with you. The tennis great Martina Navratilova called the participation of transgender women in elite female competitions insane and cheating, for which she later apologised. The hypersensitive nature of the topic is why many current athletes are reluctant to speak out. The British cyclist Victoria Hood is therefore an exception. I don't think it's fair. Um, even with the guidelines as they are at the moment, that if a male-bodied athlete um, reduces his testosterone level for 12 months, and then he's eligible to compete. Um, I, don't, I don't think that does enough. That doesn't eliminate a male advantage. Um, at, at the end of the day, it, it's a male body uh, against a female body. And the science is there and the science tells us that that performance gap is huge. But people who argue against transgender athletes competing have been accused of ignoring their human rights and of being transphobic. I see that and you know and and I don't want it to be the case that people can't do sport. I just sport has to be fair. Transgender athletes, transgender women must keep their testosterone below a, a certain level. You're saying you're not comfortable with that? No, because the whole because they're born male, so they they have a male body. That body goes through puberty with that influx of testosterone, which then shapes their body. Just by lowering that testosterone for 12 months, that's not going to eliminate a performance advantage. You know, yes, there are absolutely advantages that, that transgender women have, even after hormone therapy. therapy. Specifically, transgender women, on average, are taller, bigger, and stronger than cisgender or other women. And, and that's an advantage in many sports. However, we allow advantages in sport. <clears throat> For instance, we allow left-handed fencers to compete against right-handed fencers, even though left-handed fencers have notable advantages in the sport. What we don't allow is we don't allow overwhelming advantage. We don't, for instance, allow heavyweight boxers to get into the ring with lightweight boxers. There would be nothing meaningful about that sort of competition. The heavy big boxer wins every time. So the question isn't, do trans women have advantages? The question, the important question is, can transgender women and cisgender women compete against one another in meaningful competition? Campaigners for women in sport argue that's impossible. Nicola Williams runs an organization called Fair Play for Women. We have a situation here, it's a bit like doping, where a, a girl, if she developed and trained on testosterone, she would be called a cheat. It would be doping and she would be banned from competition. Yet we also now have these rules where a male-bodied um, person can naturally um, develop and train on the testosterone and it will not be called cheating because the rules allow it and that's not fair. Although there may be a very good reasons, honourable reasons why we, we might like, um, why some transgender people might want to compete against women, it doesn't make it fair and it's just a fact that they will have a performance advantage and so need, we need to find creative solutions for letting them compete but that must not involve opening up the female category to male-bodied people. I'm a runner, triathlete, duathlete, and the first trans man to make a men's U.S. national team. 
Chris Mozier is high profile with a Nike sponsorship. He's seen as a role model in the trans community. Once a woman, Chris now competes as a man, and he questions the general presumption of male dominance in sport. I dispute the whole idea of, of people inherently having advantage in sport because of their sex. We know that there is a great variety of uh, ability, of size, of strength, of bone density within each sex. And for us to assume that someone who's assigned female at birth would not be competitive with men, or to assume that someone assigned male at birth would be more competitive against women is just flat out wrong. Right? We don't discriminate against very tall players in the NBA. That's an advantage that they have. We didn't discriminate against Michael Phelps because of his extremely large wingspan and his ability to process lactic acid. That was an advantage that he had that made him one of the greatest, the greatest swimmer in the world. Transgender women have been competing in sports for decades, and they're not dominating the podium at the Olympics. They're not dominating the podium in your local races. Every once in a while, you will have an athlete who excels because they're a good athlete, not because they're transgender. The issue has posed difficult questions for sports governing bodies, which make up the rules and regulations. New guidance is expected from the International Olympic Committee, which is striving to find a balance between its promise of inclusivity while ensuring fair play. We went to the IOC headquarters in Lausanne to quiz the man responsible for shaping global sports policy on trans athletes. I think it's important for the sake of cisgender athletes and for transgender athletes that we get a resolution to this, um, as agreed as it can be amongst the whole breadth of stakeholders where there's these extremes of view, um, but most of us are somewhere in the middle where we want people to be able to compete, but we also want it to be fair, uh, and so I think we need to sort it out as soon as we can. There is a sense of urgency because next year's Games in Tokyo could feature the first openly trans Olympic athletes. And where the real argument starts is where you get to significant um, competition like in international championships. There is discussion, but I think at the moment it's premature to say there's going to be another event for transgender athletes. Sports struggles with controversies on fairness and inclusivity are not confined to transgender athletes. The South African runner Casta Semenya, who's been described as intersex, lost her case at the Court of Arbitration for Sport and must now lower her levels of natural testosterone if she wants to compete against other women. It's a decision which will have a much wider impact. The IAAF rule for intersex athletes will be set at 5 nanomoles per litre and there is no doubt that the IOC will quickly follow in line for transgender athletes as well and so we will have a consistent ruling of uh, intersex and transgender athletes being limited to 5 nanomoles per litre. Not all trans female athletes agree to follow the rules and suppress their testosterone. Molly Cameron is one. It means the events she enters are against men. I grew up as like a punk. Like I was into punk rock and into hardcore and into Riot Girl. And my idols, you know, when I think about becoming, you know, like transitioning and becoming a woman, I'm thinking like all my idols were these dykes with short buzzed haircuts, you know, and, um, you know, usually were more androgynous, and uh, that was the kind of vision of myself or, you know, again, I didn't really have a plan or a template, but that's what I identified with. After transition, Molly, who runs her own cycling team based in Portland, started racing against women, but stopped after local organizers received a series of complaints. They wanted Molly to hand over personal medical information. She refused. I was like, hey, I'm not okay with you know, like me providing this medical info to you guys, you know, you're to this amateur bike racing association, you know, um, I'm not really okay with how this is going down. And they were like, well, we have to, you know, deny you, you can't participate in women's races. I was like, okay, well, I can just try racing men's races, you know, because I just wanted to race my bike. Front McKinnon behind. Since then, Molly has never competed against women. And there are those who believe that should apply to all trans female athletes. The argument blew up last October when Canada's Rachel McKinnon became the first known trans woman world champion in any sport. It sparked a fierce exchange, mainly on social media. The charged nature of the row has prompted many to think twice before raising their concerns.
there's just a feeling that if you say anything, if you speak out, all of a sudden you're not being inclusive or you're transphobic. And it's not about being inclusive. You know, it's about what's fair. And it's about what's fair for women and girls. I know some of the women who, and, and they didn't say anything bad. They just said they thought it wasn't fair. And they got absolutely hounded and bullied into almost apologising, you know, they, they were not allowed to say that it wasn't fair at all. And amid all the noise, the sports authorities are considering their next move. We've listened to lots of female voices, as well as human rights, and as well as the um, experts and the scientific experts, so, um, uh, and athletes themselves have a very important voice in this. So, yeah, it is very important that everybody um, has had input, and also to understand that the, the, this isn't set in stone, and that as evidence comes along, um, it will need to be changed. I think it's really important to have these conversations, and they're really hard ones. I'm kind of like curious slash curious scared, but maybe more nervous and just like, there's this kind of like, I'm hopeful that the outcome of this ends up being a very equal and fair playing field and like very welcoming thing, but I'm also afraid that this, the, the science could become a very divisive thing. Nowhere else in the world has a debate on trans athletes been louder than here in America. It's such a divisive issue with strong views on both sides. What we have found though is a general consensus that more science, more research is needed. And as the understanding of the issue improves, the rules around it are bound to shift. That does mean finding a permanent solution which everyone can agree on seems a long way off.